which I real I feel strongly is a recruitment tool because it's a pipeline into the military. Let's just be clear. Um, and for a lot of families, whether you or I would say a lot of people that I know, not many of them did 20 years. So across those 20 years, I saw a lot of things, right? Not all of them bad, um, so I don't want to paint that. But of course, what I'm here today to talk about is some of the uh, negative experiences that I had with regards to um, race, racism, and, um, and also sexism. So for some of what I you know, saw while on active duty, I'm really intentional about um, you know, just really having a story. Like a lot of people feel like if you're in the military and you come out and you don't have this like patriotic rah, rah, rah story that maybe it didn't work for you. But it actually did, right? Like I had a successful career, but again, if you heard me talk about earlier, some of the things that started to bother me were some of the best things that some of my peers may come out and brag about, but for me, I just don't have that, I didn't have that same understanding of what we were doing. So I would say that a lot of the things that I have participated in that made me understand that I was an, an enabler of some of the things that we're here talking about in this conference that we'd like to get rid of in the world. So I start off by talking about some of the things like that I've gone through, some of the things that I've done, some of the recognition. I talk about patriotism because I think that it is the one thing that confuses us the most, right? Patriotism makes us feel like we're doing the right thing, right? It's why so many people are upset about Colin Kaepernick taking a knee because he did it at the intersection of militarism. Like, let's just be clear. Mm -hmm. um, military, mil militarism is wrapped up in patriotism, which is also the flag. Um, and so, being real clear about that, this wasn't a topic that I like started to unpack while on active duty. So just some of the recognition that I've had, this is just kind of going through, just to show that I, I think what I'm, what I'm, what the intent of showing this is that um, across a lot of years, I sacrificed a lot of my personal self. I I'll slow down on just a couple of these. This is just recognition that shows that across many bases and across many assignments um, that I received a lot of recognition for you know, doing a good job, right? Being in control of war reserve material and not really understanding what war reserve material really actually means until it's repurposed to be used in cities across the states, right? Because there's too much or there's military waste, right? So a lot of times when people talk about the military industrial complex, we don't talk enough about the fact that a lot of them are former military, right? A lot of these folks, there'll be a colonel on Friday, there's a retirement ceremony, by Wednesday they're in with a Boeing or a Raytheon shirt and everyone's still calling him or her sir, right? So if you understand that it, it's like a real slippery slope that a lot of the people that are in the, um, on the contractor side are people that I formerly worked with and so it makes sense to me that naturally it's out of control, uh, right? Because there's also a recruitment of these former military people. And in the military, there's no uh, readiness or willingness to separate those pipelines of you know, power, money, and influence. So when I talk about some of the things that I've gone through, some of the, the companies that I've worked with, a lot of these things, like this is a NCO of the um, year award where if you just read some of these things it just talks about spending a lot of money so when we're talking about peace and I'm now saying some of the money the billions of dollars that we've spent on war and then when I see that there's not mental health available in Chicago it kind of doesn't bring me great pride to participate in some of the things that I did right because this funding should be in Chicago. This funding should be available for um, the communities that need it. And so when I go through and I'm showing these things and I'm remembering a lot of the things that I participated in, um, I start to remember that usually having a military record that looks like mine would guarantee a person a, um, a, 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 a path through their military career. And so, and I, and, I, and I want to be real clear that I'm going to talk about, you know, my honest um, impressions of race and how I've seen that play out across my 20 years, um, sometimes where I've participated in it, 
and sometimes where, um, or I would just say in that the reason why I'm really clear about standing here today and just being in part of telling my story is not just because it's a story that I want to tell um, or that sometimes you hear my voice shaking is because I remember some of those things and it comes to me as I'm talking about it. So just bear with me because I'm going to talk even if my voice shakes. But I talk about these things because it's important to, to recognize that I know that there are my sisters that are still on active duty today that are going through the exact same thing that I did um, some three years ago and I know that it, it gets real. So um, on 9-11, one of the, just before 9-11, I was stationed in um, England and our unit was a, a fire wing unit. And like most, most people don't know, or if you don't know, 9-11 was the day that most military bases are on training um, um, schedules, right? And so that's why in certain places in the United States, it was hard to get a military unit to scramble to those areas because we were on a stand down or a training mission. Is that clear to everyone in the room? Most people know that already. So for me, I was sent to Norway for a NATO Air Meet, and I remember not understanding what had happened back in the US. First off, there was no English-speaking channels to really understand what, why people were jumping from the um, towers, right? So I just remember that this was a pivotal point in which there was no unpacking of what was actually happening, the, I would say, the threat or the attack on the country, but that the military was very quick to respond with a, um, a war or a plan for a war, almost instantaneous, right? And I say that it was after this trip, um, and when, once I returned home, that I realized that I was no longer in a peace um, military, that everything going forward would challenge my morals, right? That there, and I still didn't understand it because I was wrapped up in the patriotism of just being on active duty and you, will, you really don't question orders. Um, so are there any veterans in the room? I think I see y'all. I can always tell what veterans you like to look a certain type of way. But yeah, so um, just, really, just really having no unpacking of like why the country was at war or why we were going into war. Um, and so being stationed and being deployed into certain places where our teams were some of the first to go. Um, and then just really being intentional, I wouldn't say being intentional, I would say really not understanding what America was getting into was really difficult to understand. But then I'll also tell you that it became this hyper militarist type of environment where War was the way to get promoted. If you didn't deploy, you, you were left behind, right? I see you nodding your head, so you know that is. We started, you know, so people started sacrificing their families to deploy over and over and over and over again, not really realizing that there's a war injury that starts to set in, right? So I'm telling you this story of. How did they get left behind? Can we ask questions? So if they didn't deploy, then how did they get left behind? They just less money, less. What, what, what was the left behind? I will answer that if we can hold that just for, okay. um, so I'm just doing like an introduction, just kind of telling you and then I'm going to step away from the, this podium and have more of a, you know, conversation about I think what is important to kind of talk about just coming out of war and then really starting to unpack everything. So I'll take your question shortly. And so, um, not knowing why we were going into war not really knowing why we, I forgot these were in there. Not really knowing why we were going into war, not really understanding what, what to do when you came back and you just had all these thoughts, right? From, from just feeling guilt of coming back home, feeling guilt of leaving your brothers and sisters behind, um, feeling guilt of um, being home and being safe, um, and so all of that kind of coming to a, a head and you're just kind of dealing with it by yourself or with your smooth, you know, few small, you know, your group of close friends that you trust because quite honestly mental health or to seek mental health was unpopular. In fact, if you did seek mental health, it was one of the quickest ways to be pulled out of your position and to be put in the corner because you're not strong enough. 
So almost no one that I knew was seeking mental health treatment, and I knew folks who had deployed 10 times. Um, and so if you just think about the, the uh, hurt people hurt people. Um, and so a lot of the things that we started to see where this wasn't you know, my personal experience, but the experience of my best friend where, you know, on a deployment um, is where she was first raped by U.S. soldiers who, who should have been there to protect her because the bad guys were outside the gate. Um, the same best friend was in the Pentagon as a communication specialist when the plane hit on 9 11. This same best friend was reassigned to the Africa Theater where um, there was several rapes by government contractors. So what the women did to prepare themselves was to have gallon jugs in their rooms and to urinate, uh, or to, to remove themselves um, in, a, in, a, in a gallon bottle then to go outside to the uh, latrine or to the restroom pods and risk being raped by their own. Um, so when I, when I tell you that the war had also started um, a lot of savagery in a lot of ways, and so when I looked at it at the time, it's like, oh, these guys are bad guys, but it's like, come on, hurt people hurt people. And people didn't understand, you know, you had people that were gone for I'm not uh, excusing that in any way, but what I didn't realize was that no one was getting help when they were coming back home. And then it became this constant cycle of adrenaline. I see it a lot in the city Chicago Police Department, I'll be honest with you, right? When they say that these guys don't want to take and guys don't want to take time off because it's just this this constant thing. We pay more in their salaries and overtime than actual anything else. But you saw that in the military it became like this thing, this cycle of like constant deployment, constant, you know, and if you're constantly deploying, you're constantly training, which is to be in the field. I'll be honest, some of the field days were some of the best days, right? Um, it's when you're the closest, it's when you get that camaraderie. I don't care if it's, you know, Girl Scouts or those field days. It's kind of when you feel the closest to people. It's actually when you unpack a lot of stuff on the slide and you don't even realize that. I think we might have healed in the field, right? Mm -hmm. And so all of these things going on and I realized that there was a huge issue of what we were doing, what was being displayed in the media, <laughs> and then there was also the reality of not talking about what we were doing. So it was just kind of kind of not really knowing what we were doing, that we don't really talk about these issues and these intersection of all these bad things. So I talked about some of the things around rape and the rape culture that is really bad in the military and how that's almost like expected. You go to some units, it's worse in some branches of the military than others, but you go to some of these units and it's like, well, you know, the women go into deployments for a reason. And it's like, well, what, you know, what, what does that mean, you know, first sergeant? Um, and so there's this unchecked rape culture and this, you know, erasure of like women's rights in the military because this is what you signed up for. Um, and so when I really realized that those were some of the you know, worst things, I started helping my female airmen, like, what do you need to do to not go on the points, right? Like, where do, would you like to go? Sometimes if you're at a certain basis, it's a non-deployable position, because for some people, it's like, you know you're going out on this deployment. What are you accepting when you go out to um, protect your family or to make your country safe? Um, and so we started to call those things out as like the lies. And I shared this deployment as, as one of like the more critical pieces of my um, time on active duty, it was really when, um, if you remember, the Obama administration um, said that there would be a, I forget what it was actually called, was it called a troop buildup? There were so many things. Okay, so you remember it was a drawdown from Iraq, and then it was the buildup in Afghanistan. So that was the deployment was, so my position was to, help facilitate that. And so we went to Iraq and, you know, packed, I wouldn't say pack everything up, but just, you know, created logistics plans to make sure that we had things that could fly, that could go straight to Afghanistan, that would go there, other things that would be sent back to the U.S. And then I realized that there was a lot of space in there where that's where a lot of these state governments would receive their free um, and excess equipment from the military, right? And so those are some of the things that some you know transporters sent back to the U.S. So then I started understanding when I saw things on TV. Ah, oh, 
that's where it went. It literally went from the battlefield to, you know, city streets. City streets. That's real. Um, and then when I saw that those that equipment um, used primarily in my neighborhood, um, and so when you look here, it talks about these, you know, multi-billion dollars that we spent on um, this mission. A lot of these vehicles were had slipped through the cracks. Um, didn't mean to do that. So a lot of these vehicles had slipped through the cracks and what actually ended up happening was a media, a person from the media had got, um, had taken pictures of this parking lot that we had created of all of these vehicles. So if you all think about the terrain in Iraq, it's flat and you can see from here to there. If you think about Afghanistan, it's mountainous. So some vehicles that were shipped from Iraq went to Afghanistan and couldn't be used. So we literally had a car lot worth of unusable vehicles that was embarrassing now to the nation because the media had reported on it. So the Obama administration wanted to make it um, go away, and that's where you saw states were just kind of info, like you know, kind of flooded with a lot of this equipment. And one of the first times I'd ever seen that was during the uprising in, in uh, Ferguson when Mike Brown was killed. So here I have a declaration that says that I bought these vehicles. And then I see those vehicles um, terrorizing the folks back home. And so it was around this time of Michael Brown um, that I just started, that like shocked me. I just want to kind of like, I have to take a breath when I say that because I still get chills because um, I feel guilty about that. Um, some of the things that keep me up at night <coughs> is just that I never had an awareness. And that's what I want these young people to understand is that the awareness that this isn't about going out and shooting archery. You know, this isn't about a simulator that they have at the Air Force Academy that makes it look cool. Yeah. They want you to kill people with that machinery, yeah. right? And so whether you're in a support role like I was, I was really good at enabling those killers, right? And so, you know, when I talk about like what keeps me up at night, it's really around, okay, I, I have guilt, so what do I do with it? I'm not going to be that type of veteran that let that kind of be like my story. I want to be able to talk to people wherever they're comfortable. So young people want to say, you know, like, well, what are the things that you talk about racism? Racism was, my impression of racism in the military was to always erase myself, right? So in order to get all of the recognition that I got, at some point that meant I had to be less black. At some point it meant I had to be less vocal. At some point it meant my hair had to be less knotty. I have dreadlocks under here. One of the first things I did when I retired was get dreadlocks because I couldn't do it for 20 years. Um, but I think that it was really important to just really, in order to succeed, was to have this, you know, whitewashed appearance and presentation, particularly in the Air Force, which is the least diverse of the branches of the military. Um, and so, whether it's the experiences that my sisters that, that have had, or whether it was mine, which was in order to just get what I got, I had to work extremely hard, harder than most, sacrifice more than others. Um, when, you know, I would see those that were beside me, and I didn't complain, you know, it was like, it is what it is. But when you see those beside you who come from a military family who were mentored into a certain track that it took me six years to get there, right? When you talk about the racism and the unfairness, I sat on discharge boards as a senior non-commissioned officer and saw that the people that came to those boards often looked like me, whereas the people that didn't, which was the predominant race or white, you know, uh, folks who would, you know, get, uh, we'll call it, more opportunities to correct behavior, right? Or we'll call it um, just white privilege, straight up. And when we talk about that there's a strand of white nationalists in the military, I promise you I work with them in Florida. <laughs> I, am, I am very clear that they're most usually special operators, which is who I worked with the last five years. I am telling you by the tattoos that I didn't even know what that stuff meant before I started seeing it on the news and these like little websites. Um, I knew about Steve Bannon before the nation did because people in my office followed his reports. Mm. Um, I knew about Drudge Report because it was almost like morning news at the water cooler. Um, so all of these things that I'm saying about this, this last assignment really brought, 
It wasn't just the micro insults. It wasn't just the erasure of being a black woman and on active duty. It really became violent in a way that this is the area that also saw one of the largest fights in um, extremist groups. So to leave outside the gate um, was it became normal to see racism right in front of you. I'm from the south side of Chicago, so it, it was a culture shock, right? Because you just don't see those types of things. But then seeing these people work with you on active duty, this wasn't just the general population. It was the people that I worked with in my office. I mean, my goodness, when the gentleman told me, you know, Sergeant Erskine, if you had a hoodie on and it was rainy and dark, I might shoot you too. That shocked me. It made me, here I am, someone who, I would die for you, but you wouldn't think twice about shooting me because one, we're in Florida and that was just their mentality. Um, I sat in an office with, I think there were 17 or, or, or 11 white males in our office and between them they had close to 300 guns. These were, so I take that, that threat seriously. Um, that was not just in jest. Um, and I just think that when people threaten you, they mean it. Um, so to actually be in a position where I had worked my ass off for a very long time to get everything that I have, which is really, at this point, benefits and the security for my daughter, and to be in an environment where racism was the one thing that made me start to resist those 20 years, I would say resist, I would say resent a lot of it because I started to unpack a lot of things just so much more differently when it, when it was so much more real. So when I started realizing that those weren't just micro insults, those things, you know, like I just started to unpack things in such a different way and just started helping other people, like help them to understand that racism in the military has been around. Like none of you were shocked that I'm talking about this, right. and if you are, shame on you. Um, because this has been happening forever. If you all have ever heard about the Tuskegee experiment, where this government infected um, a whole lot of black men with syphilis and withheld the treatment for it, who also infected their families, and this government paid them less than $1,000 per family. Right, and, and that wasn't just because we want to test the black human. So if you just look at historically, there's position papers that talk about racism. There's a lot of things that kind of talk about it in a way that is kind of like, yeah, you know, racism's a problem in the United States, but it's actually like one of these things that we see in the cities. Like, so if we're talking about militarism and we're talking about all of these things that this racist um, military model like projects, it's no surprise that we see that in the police department. Right? And it's because you have this like model. Like you'll hear a lot of people that were in the specialized unit when we would go to trainings, you know, it is also like written in the military to I won't say in the military, in certain units to to be racist, right? So when you deploy, you have to make the bad guy seem like the bad guy. And most usually it's with racial slurs. Most usually it's with you know, you see police departments using black male figures as targets. You see, and it's that same type of briefing model that we saw and heard about in the military in order to make the bad guys seem a lot more bad. But when you really look at it, it kind of, it kind of, it, it boiled down to the places that we were invading. And then when I looked at, too, how the military was so connected around the violence that we see in these cities among black and brown folks, I see no room, or I see no light between the military, the policing, and racism. And so I just want to like pause there so we can like have some feedback because I could really go on. I really want to know like what are you all's impressions of like of what I said so far. I really would like to get away from this podium, so I'm going to get that other mic there, and then we can go. From Never mind. Don't worry about it. I was going to. There we go. 
So these were, I forgot I was supposed to show y'all some pictures because folks like pictures, right? <laughs> That's when I used to be proud of the stuff I did. No, I'm just kidding. These were uh, just like <laughs> the pictures of me. I was supposed to start with this first and I totally forgot. Someone told me like, where are your pictures? Sometimes we like to see pictures of folks on active duty. This is like a really cheesy smile. Please don't judge me um, <laughs> of, of just me. And, but this is one of the pictures that I am most proud of. This is with the Tuskegee Airmen, um, who about three months after this picture had gone on to um, join the fellow, uh, his fellow brethren. But one of the things that he had told me, and it was simple. Most, most usually when I would meet folks who had, you know, who had seen this thing, there was always a little something that they would, you know, kind of whisper. And uh, Chief Master Sergeant Thompson had told me, um, you are all stronger together because you have to see yourselves of who you are. And, you, and so basically he was saying, he had said a couple things that I won't repeat because he had a really uh, interesting dialogue and I was trying to remember not to say the actual words. But what he was saying is that, they created a brotherhood amongst themselves, and it was really after I had talked to him um, that we had kind of had like a lunch where I started realizing like, well, I'm going to start this little circle of folks um, that we can help each other. So literally, we were on Zoom, we were on Skype, just creating these like, you know, circles of support for each other while on active duty trying to understand. So out of all those things that I told you was good about, that I showed you about kind of like my career history, that was actually the package that I used to fight for um, my demotion because after a string of things had actually happened while on active duty, I had started calling out my leadership about things that just didn't make sense. And at that time, it was just bias. I wanted to know you know, so when I send my airman up for airman of the, of, the, of the year, and she's got this, and she isn't being recognized, and I started to notice the retaliation was coming back on me. Um, and then it was after a while, I think I told you all, I was kind of having some, I would say at that point, I could have benefited from going to mental health. Um, but again, it was unpopular, particularly being in the special operations unit, you had better suck it up and press on. And so just kind of internalizing that, going through so much, um, I do believe that that's when depression started to set in. And what I actually needed was more help and support and to feel comforted in that the things that I was going through, whether it was trying to unpack the military experience, racism that I was going through in my direct, like not some distant thing, like in the place that I work every day, I work with racists and bigots. Knowing that I reported to a bigot was, was difficult to just kind of deal with. And so for reasons um, whether, um, that were created, so they doctored a lot of my um, performance reports. You know, anyone that's been in the military or in any job, if your performance report does not say um, you're proficient, it's, you know, pretty easy to start on the road for um, demotion. So once they demoted me, I had already had a certain number of years once you're demoted past those years, you have to um, essentially separate because you don't have the tenure, well I should say. So the promotion doesn't have, so once I was at a senior and CEO category, once I had that demotion, it put me vulnerable for separation. So that package was both used for my, de my plea against my demotion and my plea for retention to be able to finish my 20 years. And when I talk about that, a lot of people don't know that I see you shocked because I had a stellar career. I had, you know, that circle of friends that I started talking to and the word got out. And so, you know, what, is, what does the system do, right? The bull whip of, oh no, you won't. Um, and so one of the punishments was to silence me, who I guess they thought was the strongest one. And then y'all know what happened. The rest of the folks just kind of withdrew their complaints. A lot of people just were like, well, if they would demote Tasha, then we know we're vulnerable. And so, one of the things that I really want to be clear about when we're talking about racism in the military, you'll see a lot of these veterans out here and you're like, how did you end up under the bridge? I can tell you how. And it's only because I had that record, to be honest with you, 
that when I plead, I had to plead up to the Pentagon. So the Air Force Four Star General is who my package had to go to because I was relentless, right? I did everything that I had to in order to please to say this isn't fair, right? A lot of folks around me make a lot of noise. Is this retaliation actually necessary? Is it right? And so pushing on the moral compass of the Pentagon, I found is difficult, difficult. <laughs> <laughs> extremely difficult. So the one thing that I did get out of this, while I did not get my strike back, um, I'm still working on that. I was able to make it to my 20 years, which is what I really wanted, so that I would get my pension. A lot of people don't get that, y'all. So you'll see a lot of folks being kicked out, pushed out for a lot of reasons, and you're like, there's no way. And I show you my record because there is a way. You could do it all right, and at some point at the end, which most people, at 18 years is when they come after you, right? They just kind of happened to be when I was in my sanctuary. So my point is that this can become real devastating. I have put in my packages that I was helping my family here in Chicago. I have put in my package that I couldn't afford to lose $900 per month because that's what that demotion had done to me. And so when I look at the financial impacts, if I didn't have my family support in other ways or ways to just kind of figure things out, like my daughter and I could have been homeless on active duty. And it's because of this just evasive thing, this punishment that really came from activism on active duty, um, to be honest with you. So racism in the military is a huge problem. It's not talked about enough. And it's usually because they get kicked in a corner and kicked down a flight of stairs back again like they did me. So I'll pause there. What are your questions? OK, I got a new question. Can the question if, if, if it's possible? Yes. I'll talk really loud. Yes. So you are on the south side now in Chicago, and you're going to these kids, and you're saying, they are racist. They're going to rape you. They're going to force you to do horrible things that will give you nightmares. And then they're going to kick you out without your pension. Yeah. And they are not buying this story? Because the dominant story is, we hear you. OK. The dominant story is that the military gives you an opportunity. So maybe it's just me. Or maybe it's just my, and the reason why I started incorporating my, the, the, like my record, like I'm not bragging, I promise you I'm not, but most people believe that oh, it's just, nah, it, it can't be real. Right. No, yeah. it is real. Yeah, and you can is. sacrifice, and that's just some of it, um, for the interest <laughs> of time, to be quite honest. Like, you know, out of, out of my friend group, um, I was promoted the fastest, you know, had the best assignments, um, and what happened to me, like chipped a lot of people off. Um, I had supervisors who who were captains who would call me crying, like, Sir Nurson, I can't believe this is happening to you. And I don't know what to do about it. You know, white men, you know, you know, that would come and they gave me character letters when it came down to it, but stepping up and speaking out to the boss, not even a captain would do that. Um, and so these young people don't understand because it's not the dominant narrative. Most veterans, most black veterans that come home don't talk about this. Like, I wish my grandfather had told me about his experiences. Instead, he was just disappointed that I was joining the military. Had he told me shit was real, right. I would have listened to that. And so I just want to be real when I say that when we go to these high schools, we go as real as these young people want. A lot of young people in the, in the south side of Chicago, you know, experience gun violence. So I don't always bring up killing, yeah. and I don't bring up rape. Because let's be honest, if you read the news, CPS has a rape culture of its own yeah. that actually reminds me of the military. It's to not to really address it. And to be honest, I found out that they're getting rape culture advice from the DOD. Um, so they're trying to get, uh, what do you call it, pointers as to how you deal with rape in combined <coughs> locations. And it's so strange that a school system would even report out from the Department of Defense. Um, you know, how they handle rapes when they actually don't. Um, if, you, if you pay attention to Congress, I think it's uh, Senator Gillibrand who's really trying to bring them to heal to actually deal with the military sex trauma. So it's just hard to have this conversation when economics is kind of like in there and this opportunity of, oh, my son came back and he's good. He was probably lying. You know, it's, but it's, it's hard to kind of break through that 
barrier. My family has a lot of pride because they came to a lot of these sessions. They visited me in places and saw the bells and whistles of what looks like success, but they really don't know like what that sometimes means to me. So all this stuff is like packed up in a box. I probably will never have that military love me room because of the things that those, those documents say about what I did. That is the conversation that we're just trying to have with folks um, and really re-stigmatizing the military to really let people know that I joined in the 90s when we were in peacetime. You know, 2001, like I said, there was no bridge to say, like, we're going from peacetime to shit is real, you know, but we're going to, today, most people deploy within their first year. I have friends who have joined, um, this young lady who braided my hair in Florida, she joined to help finish her last three years of nursing school. She was deployed before she took her first class. And then and on, and on active duty and in the Army, I hear that they're restricting the use of the education benefits for the first two years. And that's because they want to return on their investment. Let's just be clear. So when we're having these conversations with people, they think it's a video game. Right? And or they are being told that they're going to, oh yeah, you can go to the school, we're going to train you, la la la. But they don't tell you when. Going, no one, yeah. you don't know when, you don't know to ask. Yeah. You don't know to say, well, when can I go to school? And it'll actually be after 16-hour days. It'll actually be after you've deployed, and you're probably not even talking about what you, the, you know, the military does okay when it comes to like the reprogramming. When you get back, you have to talk to someone. They kind of call it mandatory, you know, counseling. But if people aren't open to be honest, I know I wasn't. I told a bunch of fibs. Oh, I'm good, you know. But the reality was I wasn't. Um, and so really helping people to understand that um, the simulators that the Air Force Academy is bringing to these young folks that makes it look good, you know, you're flying over the friendly skies, what, is, what does that really mean? Whether you're a transporter to take a plane full of troops to a, de to a deployed location, you flew them there, right? Um, this isn't just about the person that's outside the wire um, going through it. It's literally, if you pay attention to it, how to have these young people understand that whether you're Excuse me. Whether you're, you know, full battle rattle, or whether you're somebody that's helping process down your your injury to, um, to just war. War is unnatural. Just to really let people know, like video games is one thing, but when you're deploying and you're seeing, video, you know, you know, communication equipment come back to the to the unit, you know, and it's you know a detail to clean it off, you know, like no one's ready for that. Um, and, and I think just like the kids on the south side of Chicago, they're not ready for the trauma that they go through and really trying to show them, like, if you're trying to escape violence on the south side of Chicago, mm -hmm. you're going to replace it with mandatory violence. Mm -hmm. Full stop. Mm -hmm. Right? You can't opt out of, you can move further south or you can move to the suburbs, but you can't opt out of those deployment orders. I hope that answers your question. Yes, it did. I think maybe part of the, the appeal of the military is it, it looks like from the outside, well, there's, it's very diverse. So that's, and it, you know, that's appealing. But then the reality is like what you're talking about, it's really like a microcosm of the larger system. Because a lot of the things you're talking about happen in all these other institutions. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, there's rape in the military, there's rape in the schools, and, you know, it's, we have to, the problem starts, you know, so, so much bigger of a problem, it's really everywhere. And then we also have the problem of making our wars against people that look different than us, so that's okay, because it's dehumanizing people that, are, that aren't part of that, like, white, you know, culture. So it's okay to go kill a brown person across the world or whatever. So it's such a, you know, it, it, you know, it, it doesn't make sense. It's so paradoxical mm -hmm. that you're going to join an institution to think, yeah, these are my brothers and sisters. We're all on the same team. And then there's this racism there. And then you're going to kill people in another country, in another culture, that we don't even understand those, what those uh, people's color. culture people is and color. all that. Yeah. So that was, that's my first thing that I want to say. But I, I don't know how specific you could be about you know, what you did that pissed these people off so much. 
but if you even if you could just talk in a general term, maybe I missed what you said. You know, what did you because you were trying to say you were being the voice of dissension a little bit and there's no dissension there was allowed. No little bit. There was no little bit. I was the voice. and I to be honest, I'm gonna be honest with you. I wanna say that I relied on the privilege um, of my position, of my rank or what I thought was my position in my brain. Mm -hmm. Because the reality set in like, man, it was, it was that I had my commander's ear. The proximity between me and the three star was a flight of stairs. Um, and as long as he was available, I could go in and talk to the boss. Um, and so when the mid-level uh, lieutenant colonel and colonel were not behaving well, I thought I could keep that same, act, you know, open door policy that I had to the boss about just about any other thing um, was to talk about race. What I realized with that was that that was somehow taboo, mm -hmm. um, and that's not just somehow. And it was just things. So it was about, you know, so whether it was the people that worked with me or for me that didn't get what they deserved, or um, there were people who needed to get home on leave, um, but yet their leave was denied, and then others in the unit. So it was really this yeah. internal thing that was happening amongst, and I tell everybody, like, for my white veteran friends, please don't act like y'all don't know what this is, because it also meant that you benefited from it too, right? And, and, be, and if I was to speak out, I really wish that those who, who saw it would have too, um, because it, they could not have come down so hard on me. And I mean, people cower. Um, and I'm just not built like that. Um, so I felt like, well, I'm already out here. I might as well kind of go hard. And I did. I filed congressional complaints. I did letters to the editor the local newspaper. Like, I, at that point, it was like, I, got a, I have a spine. Um, and I'm from the south side of Chicago. I grew up in Englewood. So it was just kind of like, my last two years weren't popular kind of because I made them. But I thought the systems that were there that said whistleblowers are protected, that this is an investigation and it's protected, we won't tell anybody who told us, all that was a lie. Everything I told an investigator, they went and called my commander. Before I got back to the unit, I had an appointment with the commander, <laughs> who was like, oh, you want to go and snitch? Okay. <laughs> right. And all you were asking was fairness. Fairness. That's it. Fairness. Mm -hmm. And so, it was a lot of things in that. It was um, at the time when they pulled me out of my position, I, it was a lot of jealousy. Um, so the previous assignment before I got to Florida was a specialized um, assignment where I had worked with the civilian force who, so for a lot of reasons, I became by name requested to go on trips that were outside of my unit, that was connected to my unit, but it was more broad and more uh, feather in the cap. And around the time that I started complaining was when I was at the top of my game. And to see people who had um, more rank than me do petty things to try to undermine um, all of that. So to be pulled off those, those, those assignments was um, the easier way to start writing bad reports. So to pull me out of positions of power so now you can say, well, she's no longer operating at the senior and CEO capacity. It made it easy to demote me. Do you see how easy? And it didn't take very many actions. And it happened so quick. And I actually would have never, I'm still standing here today as a result of that, right? And I still don't know how that happens. Because there were systems in place that should have presented it, prevented it. There were people in place who should have done their job, who should have called it out. But they were afraid. Instead, people sent me you know, paper notes from the balcony, like, hey, you should do this, but they never spoke out in their powerful, in their positions of power to actually, like, bridge that. that, that These that. guys are racist, right? Your superiors were racist, right? You're, those are the ones that you were saying. I'm, I'm saying I believe they were extremists on active duty. Right. There's, there's no, there's no way they weren't. Um, mm -hmm. And I didn't know about the tattoos and some of the signs and signals and, you know, all this little stuff until later. And I'm very clear that I worked with those those folks. Um, and again, they most of these people have been in Lower Alabama, the Panhandle of Florida, for 18, 19 years. Most people that are in special operations have been there their entire career. So I came into a unit that was a 
you know, that, that was long standing and most of those people had been there for their entire career and then there was never, from what I'm told, I was one of the first black women in that particular unit that I was in. They weren't ready for me and then for me. <laughs> um, um, and it, it was, I called it the twilight zone on the second day in the office. It was just not a normal experience. I had had 15 years of traveling all over the place. I've never had a unit be so cold so blunt in the way that they did not receive me and the micro insults were a daily thing. And I don't know how you feel about having darts thrown at you when you're working your butt off every day, but it's hurtful, it's harmful, and it's violent. Um, and so at some point, I just got tired of it. And it was like, well, it's gonna be, I'm gonna make at least all the noise I can, kicking and screaming going out the door. Um, and I did a pretty good job. Uh, but I hear they're still talking about Erskine. So. <laughs> Regarding moral injury, I can relate as yeah. uh, being on active duty, my job was as an intel analyst. Mm. And uh, what I was doing on deployment was violating international law mm. by spying on other countries while they were doing military exercises and recording their weapon systems. So the US military could send that information back to NSA for weapons manufacturers to reverse engineer those weapon systems to make countermeasures. So, like putting those, all those like larger cogs together, it took me a long time to unpack. Mm -hmm. And as far as like you were saying with racism in the military, there was certain instances that it took me a long time to realize like this was racist mm -hmm. because. The way that the culture is presented, it's just something that's, it's just like a, a veil. Mm -hmm. You don't realize that it's happening mm -hmm. until you take a step back. Right. And when someone is discharged from the military under other than honorable conditions, they lose their benefits. Yeah. You don't get access to the VA. You don't get your education benefits. So you have no health care. You have no access to disability. You don't get disability payments. Like all those things are just gone. Yeah, and that, quite honestly, it was that. It was. It was also making that noise that I talked about in the, in, in my final years. But it was fighting for that. Mm -hmm. I knew that here I am. I had busted my everything to do everything they told me to do, and I did it extremely well. And then you turn your back on me when I perhaps need you the most. But this is actually what. It, it, it's just not right, but to say that you're going to make me vulnerable at my 18th year of taking away everything that I worked for, and I just, you know, what motivates me is my daughter, right? And it's like, okay. And so that's the fight, and what pissed me off enough was about how could you actually do this? Um, and how many times I worked, how many other people, there were people who didn't have the record I did. I'm going to be very honest, like, some people just did not win this thing. And I became desperate because I saw, like, they actually get away with it. There was a young woman who was 19, in her 19th, I think they were 19th year, third month, and they separated her. That, she had three children. Her husband was deployed at the time that they separated her. She had nowhere to go in the, in the context of, like, job, there was no preparation, there was no transition program that you usually get when you're really getting out on like a honorable type of track. She didn't get those services. And I'm telling you, if it wasn't for her husband, that woman and her three children would not have access to health care. The TRICARE benefits that my daughter and I have. The fact that, you know, you know, no matter what it is, I could go as a veteran, I could go as TRICARE. They were trying to take that away. And you're right. And they used the other than honorable because it's a vague, gray area that they really don't have to prove that much. So they overuse it. And so you see a lot of people out here where you're like, you're a veteran, why don't you go and get some help? A lot of times, it's like this brother just said, they can't get it because they were pushed out under those, you know, mm -hmm. other than, you know, honorable. And a lot of times, if you don't plead for it, and it's sometimes after a long, you know, grace period, I forgot what that looks like. But sometimes you don't get those benefits back. And for a lot of people, that's the source of their pain. Um, so thank you for looking that up. That's, that's extremely good. Hi. First of all, I want to thank you for being vulnerable in this space today. Um, so what are some realistic alternatives 
for those who might be in serious financial need and greatly benefit from programs like the ROTC program? That's such a great question. We are, oh, so her question, you want to repeat it louder? No, just yeah. to, no, you, uh, you want me to do yeah. some yeah. the mic? Yeah. So she's saying, what are some of, so basically if economics is like the largest thing that is driving people to, you know, self-draft into the military, what are some of the alternatives that we're seeing? For one, at the school level, we're looking at, CPS used to hold these programs, the, the career technical education programs in school, in most of the South Side schools. So you have to kind of wonder, like, is there a greater, uh, this isn't a conspiracy, but it sure does feel like you remove these points for people to be able to become entrepreneurs, to go into the job tracks, right, into these trades that pay, pay money. Logistics is one of the fastest growing fields that actually pays around $70,000 if you have a degree. So talk about these young people who used to graduate out of high school knowing how to you know, do certain type of mechanics. Um, those are the types of things that we're looking at CPS to bring back into schools. But I'm gonna tell you, some of these schools, they really just need a full-time counselor, mm -hmm. right? A lot of these schools, CPS will have a lot, will have really, I had to understand how to read past it and I know where, how to get the truth. But, you know, there's this number of, you know, counselors, but what they don't tell you is that they're spending two hours a day at each school. Yeah. It is ineffective when you have 98% poverty rate. It is ineffective when you have 16% in foster care. It is ineffective when you have these young people who are coming to school dodging bullets. Their cousins mm -hmm. may have gotten shot. Their father or their mother are incarcerated. And so you see all of this happening, and I feel like the school district ignores that, and then also then turn around and punish those young people for how they might misbehave in class. Um, and so for some of these, you still see some of these judges who are telling folk, we'll let you off if you join the Army. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. let's, let's be clear on what that is. Um, and it's the same priming that we see of mostly black and brown folks that says that the military is an answer, it's the opportunity for you. And I tell people, if the military was so great in a Gerald TC model, we would see more than 4% of white kids enrolled in it. So we're really looking for the, the, the school system to bring back a lot of those programs, which I think will help, even with this graduation requirement that they're going to have, put people into the position of where they can actually earn money outside of this one thing.